When it all goes wrong and, and, and the, the, um, the, the patient um, isn't quite happy with, them, with their outcome, um, then it's, uh, and they, they may issue a claim, then it comes to me and I, I deal with a, a whole range of claims, everything from you know, superficial burns to where plastic surgery has, has gone very wrong and people may end up with a severe debilitating um, injury. Um, but I'm going to pick up from, from where Katie, Katie left, left off and talk a little bit um, about where we see um, claims most frequently. Um, we see a lot of claims arising out of burns, infection, allergies, um, in surgery, intraoperative and postoperative issues, and we see a lot of claims for psychiatric damage. I imagine that probably 60 to 70 percent of the claims we see, um, you know, whether it's just somebody who's got a very small, you know, burn on their cheek, half centimetre, is, is likely to tag on the end of a claim, a claim for, for psychiatric or psychological, psychological damage. And nine times out of ten, they'll be able to get a report from a psychiatrist or a psychologist to say that, yes, they have suffered some harm as a consequence of a very small injury. But at the moment, where we see most um, claims coming through is in relation to consent and the consenting procedure. Um, and whilst wishing not to, to bore you too much, um, the law on consent has recently changed. And where previously it was very much up to the practitioner to tell the patient about what they think they ought to know, um, and so taking a very paternalistic approach to advising um, a patient or a client about what they think what they ought to know about procedure. It's now all, it's a, it's, it's a two-way street now. It's about advising your patient about all of the risks, what the alternatives to treatment are, um, and letting them make decisions um, about their treatment. You've got to take, make an individual assessment of that individual patient. So take into account their age, their sex, um, you know, the product that they're buying, what information and research they've done themselves, you know, what they, they know about it. If they want um, a procedure for a particular problem and there may be two or three other alternatives um, that are, are available to them, it's about saying, well, actually, you've chosen this product, but there are two or three other products or two or three other treatments that are available to you what do you think about these? These are the risks and the associated benefits, and it's for you to make an informed decision. It is about documenting everything, um, and you know, document and discuss, um, um, discuss, document. So anything that that patient highlights that you really should be writing down, um, and in terms of just you know highlighting risks, again, it's about making an assessment of that patient as they come through the door. If they've said, well, I've got an allergy to X, Y, and Z, and you know that a particular product might have a very rare risk of you know an adverse adverse effect on them, then you need to warn them about that risk. If you're aware that perhaps they've got some medical problem might be affected for it, it might be 0.1 percent. But if the risk is there and you're aware of it, then you need to advise them about it. You know, if there's a 50 percent risk. The rule of thumb used to be probably about 5%. That's changed now. Um, there is no, you know, even if there's a, there is a minute risk and it, you can associate that risk with that patient because of the information that they have told you, then you've got to relay that to them. I suppose in terms of top 10 tips, how to avoid a claim arising um, out, of, out of consent. Um, consent forms, make sure the consent form is signed and dated by the patient, as Katie said, you know, if there's not something there and it's not documented, um, then, it, then it didn't happen. Um, too many consent forms aren't signed, um, despite conversations with a patient having taken place. So you may well have sat down and spoken to 20 or 30 minutes to a patient about the pros and cons, but if there's nothing there and they haven't signed a consent form, then you, you're going to be in great difficulty defending a claim um, if a patient is subsequently dissatisfied with treatment. Um, do tailor your consent forms for different treatments, tick box consent forms, um, where you can tick off um, what you've explained um, is much better than a, than a blanket pro forma. Um, the tick box exercise allows you um, to say exactly what has been discussed. Um, and so if there's a query later on, you can immediately go to that tick box and say, well, we discussed that there was an X percent risk of you suffering um, a, a burn or an allergic reaction. Um, and as we talked about, some risks are very rare, but if your patient has told you about some uh, an allergy or something that they are, are suffering from and you think that they may you know, potentially have a risk from that, do document that. 
Um, ideally, we would suggest that aftercare instructions um, are handed out with, um, after you've, you've signed a consent form. Um, and I would also try to make sure that the patient signs the consent form as well, or documents that they've received an aftercare instruction. Very often we see patients who may say, well, you didn't tell me that I couldn't go in the sun, or you, know, you didn't say, you know, don't put cream when I go home, and they, they get an infection um, or, or, or have some kind of um, reaction. Um, one consent form for treatment um, isn't always enough. So, for example, um, if you have a signed consent form in relation to a course of laser hair removal treatment, which is carried out over a three-month period, if that patient comes back in 12 months' time, then you will need to reconsent. Um, patients' memories fade, and it's not good enough to say, well, I told them last January, and you're, you know, you're 18 months down the line. They've come in for the same procedure. Something goes wrong, and the patient will say, well... I don't know, I can't remember, it was 18 months ago. You can't rely on that first consent form. Sorry, how about if a clinic brings in a reused machine? Yeah. New consent form again? I would do. Just, it's all about covering your back. So it really is. Change in medical history. Yeah, if you know anything, you know, that if that person suddenly develops, you know, dermatitis during the treatment or something to that effect, or, yeah, it's all relevant. Yeah. Exactly. So it, it is about having a clear notes about the, about the discussions that you've had with that patient. And if they won't engage and they're not prepared, um, you know, they're silent or they don't accept the risk, then you, you need, to, um, need to think carefully about it. Um, if leaflets are provided, I keep an extra copy in the record, just clip them in. Um, or, you know, even now doing a screenshot, if you've got electronic records, just to say, well... This was the leaflet that the patient was provided with um, and get them to endorse it in some way if they sign it and then you've got that in the record and you can say, well, you've countersigned it, we've got a photograph of that and if it's an electronic record or you've got paper records, clip it in. Um, cooling off periods, I think that's more so with um, invasive surgery, um, but we see quite a lot of claims, particularly um, if people want surgical procedures where they go in and... Um, they speak to, to the clinician and the clinician says, well, I can fit you in in two days' time. Um, you know, the suggested period is about 14 days. It's not really regulated, um, but if people, someone does bring a claim, it does put you in a, a more of a difficult position to defend it. Um, if somebody is in the throes of enthusiasm about, um, you know, having a, a breast augmentation or something like that, um, they're told on day one and they pop in on day three and three days later, you know, three months later, they said, well, actually, if I'd gone away and thought about it for a longer period, I might not have had that procedure. I might have had an alternative procedure. I think on a practical level, but again, I think it's about assessing that individual. If you're able to have a conversation with an individual and they've gone away and they've done their research and, you know, they're very happy and to, to accept the risks in sort of the non-invasive sort of, you know, more, shall we say, bog standard type procedures, perhaps, you know, 14 days is, is, is a bit excessive. Um, but if somebody is informed about all the risks, and it's a fairly low level procedure with a low risk rather than something like a, you know, a breast augmentation or a rhinoplasty or something like that, um, I think it's a, a, about non-invasive, I think it's a common sense approach, really. Quite often, I, 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 we do see claims where um, People have insisted on having an increase in perhaps the amount of filler that they've had in their, and they're, they're, they're advised against it and said, you know, you've, you don't need any more. This is the, the right amount for, for what your, your requirements are. And they've insisted on it. And instead of saying, well, I'll tell you what, go away and think about it. These are the risks. These are the benefits. And that practitioner has done it. And then the patient is dissatisfied with the results. Say, well, you, actually, you didn't tell me about this. Um, then, you know, that, that's, a, that's another area where we do, do see claims because there's not been a, a cooling off period, so to say, and they haven't have been able to think about it. Um, if you think that a patient is particularly psychologically vulnerable, you know, um, patients perhaps with body dysmorphia or, you know, they, they appear a bit fragile, just really think about whether you should be providing with them with the treatment um, that they you know, that they're requesting. I mean, sometimes there's just that red light comes in and it's, you know, it's okay to say no to somebody. Um, you know, they can't bring a claim against you because you've refused to, refused to treat them. Um, and don't depart from the proposed treatments um, that you've consented them for. So if you've said that you're going to provide them with laser treatment at X setting and during that procedure you think, oh, well, it's not working or, you know, don't increase the setting and if you subsequently get a patient with a burn um, then and you haven't consented them or told them 
um, then you, you'll get a claim against you and it, it, it will be indefensible. Um, and so I think in conclusion, um, very much as sort of Katie has emphasised, it is about discussing, um, documenting and not departing from the, from the treatment that you've, you've consented, consented a patient for.